Every night I ask you questions and I tell you don't answer me. I just want you to think. I want you to answer me now. Just say yes or no. Say it audibly so I can hear you. Are you honest people, yes or no? Are you reasonable people, yes or no? Yes. Are you fair-minded, yes or no? Yes. Are you good-looking, yes or no? <laughs> the roof should have come off. You are good-looking. But I'm more concerned with fair-minded, reasonable, and honest. Because my presentation requires that from you. For you to receive it as it is in Jesus. Let me come straight to the point. Most people go to church on Sunday. Am I right? Yes. Most people do. Most people do because they believe that's the right thing to do. And you really can't condemn a man too heavily or at all if he sincerely believes that is the right thing to do. The Bible does say of God in Acts chapter 17 verse 30, the times of this ignorance God winked at. When there is genuine ignorance, God overlooks it. And I told you last week, genuine ignorance means two things. One, I did not know. Two, I had no way of knowing. By the way, if you're here for the first time, I will release you at 10 to 1. It's now 19 minutes after 12. In 10 to 1, I let you go. Most people observe Sunday as the Sabbath. Yet the Bible tells us very clearly that the Sabbath of the Lord is the seventh day. So what we have is a conflict between what God says and between what the overwhelming majority of the world's population says. And the absolute question is, who is right? Let me first take a look at the eight texts in the Bible that mention the first day of the week. As we continue with the subject, research suggests, and so does God. Now before I review these eight verses, the reason for the title is this. One of the things that make me smile when I read research papers is that the researcher or researchers frequently suggest. Research suggests that vitamin E is good or bad for you. Research suggests that exposure to sunlight is not as bad as some people think. Research suggests the evidence points, the data indicate there's seldom a categorical statement. Research proves. Now, I'm no researcher, but I, my guess, my layman's guess is that by suggesting if the next research project from across the country comes up with something different, you can always say, well, I just suggested. God can come down to our level and he also suggests for our consideration. And I want you to look at what the Bible suggests. Since we have almost a reverential approach to what research suggests, and this is a research institution, let us take the same honest approach to what the Bible suggests. Matthew chapter 28, reading verse 1 as we continue, research suggests so does God. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. First usage of the expression, the first day of the week. And all that verse tells us that, let's hear it again, in the end of the Sabbath, Look at the chronology. Sabbath was done. As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, meaning the first day of the week comes when the Sabbath of the Bible is passed. Let's go to the next passage. Mark chapter 16, reading from verse 1. We shall go to verse 2. Mark 16, verses 1 and 2. Thank you again for coming. And may God bless you for your sacrifice of time. And when the Sabbath was passed... Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Verse 2, and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. All that verse says is essentially what Matthew 28, 1 says, that after the Sabbath was passed, then the ladies came to embalm the body of Jesus Christ. 
Stay in Mark chapter 16. Let's look at verse 9. Mark says, Now upon the first day of the week, when Jesus, early in the morning, when Jesus was risen from the grave, came Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. She was the first one to see him. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Again, like Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2, Mark 16, 9. It just tells us when they came. On the first day of the week, early in the morning, Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Let's go now to the book of Luke. Chapter 24, reading verse 1. Our fourth verse. As we continue, research suggests, and so does God. 26 minutes after 12. Luke 24, reading verse 1, the Bible says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found out the body of the Lord Jesus. Again, as in the case of Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2, Mark 16, 9, Luke 24, 1 tells us very simply that the first day of the week was when they came to anoint the body of Jesus. The Sabbath was passed and gone. Text number 5, John chapter 20, reading verse 1. John 20, reading verse 1, as we continue, research suggests and so does God. The Bible says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and findeth the, sepul the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Same sentiment as in the preceding four verses. Mary Magdalene, she's mentioned in Mark, uh, Mark 69, first person to get to the tomb, she sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher. When it was yet dark. She could hardly wait for the Sabbath to be passed. She was so eager to come and to anoint the body of her beloved Lord, Jesus Christ, who had exorcised her of seven demons and whom she loved so dearly. John, same chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. All that verse says is on the first day of the week, the disciples were not gathered for church service. They were scared to death. They locked the door to a room and they were in that room trembling for fear of the Jews. They were hiding out, not worshiping. That's six texts. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Let's read verse 7. As we continue, research suggests, and so does God. Acts chapter 20, reading verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Upon the first day of the week, Paul preached unto them. That's all it says. Ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. They came together to break bread. This was not unusual in Acts chapter 2, verse 46. It says, And they continuing with one accord in the temple, and in breaking bread from house to house. Now the verse says, continuing daily in the temple. I should include that word daily. Every day they were in the temple. Every day they were breaking bread. They'd eat their bread with gladness and singleness of heart. So the fact that they broke bread on the first day of the week in Acts chapter 20 verse 7 does not make that special. They did that every day. So if Acts 27 is an argument for first day observance, then every day of the week is a similar argument because Acts 2.46 tells us every day they were in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Now, I was examining the evidence in the book of Acts. Acts gives us the life of the early church. Let's go to Acts 13 and look at the life of Paul particularly. Next to Jesus, no one taught the Bible as well or as clearly as the Apostle Paul. A very educated man. He would have fitted in very well on the campus of Loma Linda. Very well educated. A reasonable man. And I'll show you texts in the scripture where Paul is always reasoning with people. You see, it is easy to reason with intelligent people such as you are because you see the truth quickly. You assess the statistics quickly. 
You analyze the data quickly and then you come to reasonable conclusions that you are sure that your similarly educated peers can support. You have to do that or you are left out of the institution. Acts chapter 13, verse 14. Reading for public purposes from the King James Version. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch of Pisidia, and they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. That's Paul and his companions. On the Sabbath day and sat down. Then Paul was asked to preach. He preached a fairly long sermon all the way down to verse 42 of Acts chapter 13. The Bible said, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now we have two Sabbaths. That Paul was there. And in verse 44, the Bible says, And the next Sabbath came almost all the city together to hear the word of God. Paul and his companions, they worshipped on the Sabbath given to us by Scripture, not by opinions, not by traditions, not by what is custom. Custom that has no biblical foundation. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. Looking again at the life of Paul. Research suggests, and so does God, Acts 16, verse 13, now they are in Philippi. The Bible says, and on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. Now, that's an old King James word. That's why I love this version. Prayer was wont. What does that mean? It was the custom for people to go by that riverside on Sabbath and pray and worship. So Paul went where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which were sorted thither. That was their church. They did not have gentry gym. They did not have that lovely temple called University Church or Campus Hill or whatever other lovely structure that dot this area. By the riverside where prayer was wont to be made, that was the custom of the believers in the town of Philippi. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. Looking at Paul again as we continue, research suggests, and so does God. Acts 17, reading from verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Here we have Paul reasoning. Now notice verse 2, as his manner was, or manner there means custom, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. The Scriptures are very reasonable. Do you know God is not unreasonable? He calls us in Isaiah 1 verse 18, I believe it is. Come now, let us reason together. God wants us to see that obeying Him makes sense. He wants us to see that His religion appeals to the intelligent mind. And it really does. A God who created heaven and earth, who created the atom, and the cell and the mitochondria, that God must be reasonable and organized and scientific. And so Paul reasoned with them three Sabbath days out of the Scriptures. Let's go to Acts chapter 18. Acts 18, reading from verse 1. After these things, Paul passed through, departed from Athens and came to Corinth. He had this fancy meeting in Athens. Didn't go very well because he, he, I guess he departed somewhat from the reasoning he's accustomed to doing. But his success was not that great on Mars Hill. Now he comes to Corinth. Go to verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath day and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now every Sabbath day, how long was he there in Thessalonica? Go to verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months. Every Sabbath, verse 4 says, he reasoned. That's, verse, that's chapter 18 of the book of Acts. Look at verse 19, also of chapter 18. That verse ends by saying, he went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. He was always reasoning. Because what he was saying made sense. If what I'm saying makes sense, I cannot reason. The basis for Paul to be able to reason is what he was saying makes sense. Sabbath observance makes sense. When it's done on the platform of faith, you may call that contradictory. It's not. Sense and faith are not contradictory concepts. 
Because we're told in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God. Through faith. Now the scientific method reverses that. We understand first, then we have faith. The Bible says, no, you're reversing it. You come with faith, you will understand. Faith and science, they go together. Now, let's go back to Acts 20, verse 7. As we continue, research suggests, so does God, it is 25 minutes to 1. We have 15 minutes left. You have Acts 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. This is the single New Testament verse that is used to show that the early Christians worshipped on Sunday. Let me show you something which I consider my own version of statistics. I'm not a statistician, but I know you respect statistics. You do biostats, take away statistics, research falls to the ground. Now, here is the one reference in the book of Acts. Are you with me? In the book of Acts, this is Acts chapter 20, verse 7, on which most people observe Sunday. This represents the references to Sabbath keeping. How did I arrive at this? In Acts chapter 13, verse 14, Paul was in the, Sabbath, in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Actually, this figure should be 240. In verse 42, the Gentiles said, come preach to us again. And they preached again in verse 44 of Acts 13. Acts 16, verse 13, Paul went by the riverside on the Sabbath where prayer was wont to be made. Acts 17, verse 2, three Sabbath days, Paul reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Acts 18, verse 11, one year and six months. Now, we still don't have 240 or 239. Let's go to Acts, stay in Acts 20 where we are. Let's go to verse 25. But I want you to keep this in mind. One text supports millions of people observing Sunday. This represents what the disciples of Jesus Christ did. Now, statistically, you tell me, can I reason with you? Yes or no? Don't answer. Can I reason with you statistically? Let me show you the other occurrences of Sabbath observance. Acts 20, reading from verse 25. This is Paul speaking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to recall this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Why is his, are his hands pure from people's blood? The next verse tells us, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul was not afraid to let people know what they needed to know. Only then could he tell God, No one's blood is on my hand. I did not hold it back. I did not water it down to please people. It is important that a preacher be able to say to God, There's no one from Loma Linda whose blood is on my hand because I told them as it is. Verse 27, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the whole which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the flock of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, verse 29, Acts 20, shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Paul is saying, when I leave, they won't do it while I'm here because they can't try to deceive you while I'm here. When I leave, they'll try. They'll come in from the outside and they will rise up from within. Therefore, verse 31, watch and remember that by the space of how long? Three years. I ceased not to warn everyone night and day for three years. And since it was Paul's custom to worship on Sabbath, for three years, every Sabbath, Paul was reasoning and warning. Let me show you the stats again. This is what most people base Sunday observance on from a biblical perspective. Acts 20, verse 7. This is the evidence the Bible suggests for the Seventh-day Sabbath observance. So I can write a paper. If you were to write a research report based on this, you, driven by the impulse of academic honesty, would have to say, research suggests that the Sabbath is the seventh day. I can't compel your heart. I can't do that. 
But you told me earlier you're honest. You said you were reasonable. You said you were fair-minded and you also said you're good-looking. <laughs> Are you still honest? Yes or no? Are you still reasonable? Yes or no? Are you still fair-minded? Yes or no? Your beauty is evident. I don't need to ask you. Then what will you do? Don't do that. Don't do that in your heart. Don't do that. This is the shortest sermon I'll be preaching. 19 minutes to 1. All those who think I have been unreasonable, raise your hands. All decent people who believe I have been reasonable, raise your hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now God is watching us. Closing this. God is watching us. I told you I like to speak to intelligent people. It doesn't take long for them to get the point. So I can close the Bible. We're having service this Sabbath. I want you to come. That's all. I want you to come with statistic, statistical justification. I want you to come. Now you cannot be honest in the laboratory when you do your research and be dishonest in your spiritual. You cannot do that. Because at some point, your religious dishonesty will spill over into the lab. You must be honest in everything and I think you desire to be. We have a service this coming Sabbath. I want you to come. Two services. One at 11, one at 5. I want you to come. I'll give you one more text. I pray. Ask for your response and I pray. It's 18 minutes to 1. Isaiah 58, 13, 14. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing my pleasure on thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor it, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. God promises for those who properly keep his Sabbath, he will cause them to rise to the highest level in whatever they do. I've told you, God is a God of incentives. I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. I will make you the best at what you do, God says. If you have the courage to take a stand contrary to what most of the world does, but your stand will be based on biblical evidence which suggests the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And I did not even mention Jesus' custom, which was to keep the same day, Luke 4.16. I'm issuing a personal invitation to you if you've not observed the Sabbath day. I just want you to come and try one. One. If you've smoked 50 years, you can stop smoking for one day. If you've been drinking 100 years, you can stop drinking one day. If you're accustomed to cussing like a fisherman for 45 years, you can spend one day and not cuss. You can keep one Sabbath. One. If for no other reason than in honor of statistical honesty, one. I want you to come this Sabbath right here, am I right? Right here, 11 o'clock. All those who will come at my invitation, raise your hand. I want you to come. 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 Stand up. Let me pray for you. I'm going to ask God to give you courage to stand by your decision. Don't stand up because someone else stood. No, no, don't do that. Please don't do that. Don't do that. Stand because you're standing for you. Don't stand for someone else. Because God notice, notices the discrepancy. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I have presented a simple message. Father, I believe the reasonableness of the message has touched the hearts of those who have come. 
Father, I also know that Jesus, the greatest preacher in the history of the universe, was not successful with everyone who heard him. But Father, I believe that the Spirit has touched hearts here today and people have decided they will come who perhaps do not have a religious tradition of observing the Seventh-day Sabbath. When they come, Father, I want you to bless them, to show them that they have taken the right step. Bring us back tonight. Bring us back tonight, dear God, to hear this message with additional information. Now take us safely to our various locations of business, I pray, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.